your second or your second lesson, your first lesson on video looks at the Hitler and the origins of anti-Semitism within his own personal belief system and what we can learn from not only his early years, but his experience during the First World War and the early years of the Nazi party, but when and how his uh, rabid anti-Semitism was formed. Now, what do we know about Hitler, the youth? Um, the truth is not much. Uh, there is a lot of you know, as I say, literature out there, but much of what's been written about Hitler as a youth is speculative. What historians have put forth in terms of what we know concretely about Hitler is that he was most certainly interested in art. Everybody knows, and there's lots of documentary evidence to prove it, that he was a failed applicant to an art college in Vienna. Uh, we know that from his own writings and from his own experiences, uh, collections of theater tickets, um, and so on and so forth, that he was a fan of Wagner's operatic romanticization of the German mythics, uh, characters and heroes. Of course, um, as I had mentioned to you previously, there was a lot of latent anti-Semitism within the Wagner operatic. Wagner himself, of course, was a, a student of uh, Houston Stewart Chamberlain. His daughter was in fact married to him. And as a consequence of that, and also too as a consequence of Wagner's latent anti-Semitism, the Wagner operatics were very much about the romanticization of the German folk and the um, pitted against sort of the the scheming Jew, um, not not that not necessarily directly, but um, indirectly. He also, from a very early age, and it's also it's very clear from what little we know about him, that he thought social democracy, and more particularly the multiculturalism which he experienced in Vienna, living part of a multicultural sort of polygon empire, um, he found these abhorrent characteristics. He was and would remain a person on the margins of society until 1914, when he was rescued from the margins by, of course, the uh, events of the First World War. Uh, before you record, actually. So, um, yeah, like, as I said, little, uh, little or much is known. Now, you probably have heard and indulged in some of the theories on his early years, and there's a huge amount of debate amongst historians, most of whom are quote unquote psycho historians, such as the infamous Robert Waite. Um, and these people write on the origins of Hitler's obsession with race, and they want to try and find something in Hitler's youth that, you know, links his sort of fanatical eliminationist anti-Semitism to, to a particular moment in his youth. Most of what's written out there is quite unhelpful. And in fact, we know very little on, about his early years on which to make any assumptions whatsoever. So we have to try and avoid these. Um, what we do know is that Vienna, where he lived, contained a large Jewish population and Hitler claimed to have become anti-Semitic there. Apparently, uh, there's a story he writes in Mein Kampf that he was horrified about the appearance of the Ostjude, the Eastern Jew, the type of refugee fleeing the pogrom in Russia. These are the people who are more um, of the Hasidic community <coughs> with the payot, et cetera, et cetera. And these types of people, um, these types of people, he claims to have, have thought were abhorred that they were they were not quite men. They were they were something different. So what can we assume now? As I'm going to talk about later in the lesson, we can't take a lot of Mein Kampf on its face. What we, it's safe to say about Hitler is that, first, of the, <clears throat> first and foremost, that Austria, where he grew up, was virtu uh, virulently anti-Semitic. Uh, Hitler was no doubt, and it would have been impossible to have lived there, especially during the time of Karl Luger, the anti-Semitic mayor of Vienna, uh, to not have been exposed to as a uh, sort of a German-Austrian uh, person to anti-Semitism in society. Uh, the sort of Vietnamese gutter press, so to speak, uh, is everywhere, and it's uh, uh, the Viennese uh, culture. It's probably the most literate in the world. So through reading and in social groups, he probably would have, and mo actually probably is no, uh, he would have been exposed to anti-Semitism as sort of a norm in everyday life. <laughs> However, it is also safe to assume from what we know about him, that it had no profound impact on him. In fact, Hitler doesn't express in any sort of way, up until at least the end of the war, very notable anti-Semitic views. What is wrong to assume, and this is where we get into debunking the social history, there's no evidence that his relationship with his parents, though it was difficult, resulted in some sort of psychotic obsession with the Jews or any sort of array of nervosis, neurosis or subconscious conflicts that would sort of lead to the Holocaust. That would be completely wrong. Um, it is also wrong to assume that he had some sort of Jewish ancestry that he tried to hide. 
uh, Ian Kershaw spends a lot of time in his book Hitler uh, biography, and especially the first edition, talking about the falsehoods about Hitler's Jewish ancestry. In fact, he goes to point out, interestingly, in that book, that um, not only was Hitler not from uh, <clears throat> Jewish ancestry, there were actually no Jews in the areas in which his family grew up until after Hitler left. So it would have been technically impossible for by studying records to have assumed that Hitler had any sort of Jewish ancestry at all. Also, there's a whole bunch of nonsense about, you know, <clears throat> whether Hitler was, you know, breastfed by a Jewish wet nurse and the connection that made or the fact that his mother had difficulty breastfeeding or he wasn't breastfed or whatever it happens to be. There's a whole weird obsession about Hitler and breastfeeding that led to um, that led to the Jews uh, sort of being the target of his, his sort of subconscious rage. Anyways, the conclusion of all of this is effectively that there are many theories on his early years and they don't help us understand Hitler whatsoever, so don't indulge in them. Anyways, what we do know, back to the more concrete stuff, what we can prove that his experience in World War I was transformative, most certainly in the development of his anti-Semitism. We do know that Hitler fought bravely in an infantry unit of the Bavarian infantry during the war. He, in fact, migrated to Bavaria in 1911 after his father died and left him a quite substantial sum of money, in fact, for those days. And he used that money to move to Germany. In Germany, he found himself in Bavaria, in Munich, and in Munich, he joined the Bavarian infantry fighting throughout most of the war. Hitler was decorated as a war hero. Um, even though he never achieved a high rank, he was... Uh, and was able to, at least, especially in the early years of the Nazi party, sort of gain credence among right-wing nationalists for his wartime service. We do know um, that when he was uh, when the war was over, he was in hospital. He had been gassed by the British and was suffering from temporary blindness from, from, from gas. Um, and we do know that in the hospital at the end of the war, the cores of his belief were already established. By the end of the war, we know, we know without, without fail that Hitler was A, a German nationalist, he supported authoritarianism, and he opposed democracy, and more particularly socialism. We do know that he had a racially inspired view of society. He had a, a, a rabid anti-Semitism that had developed, and he started to venerate the German Volk, this idea of a master race based on the sort of invented tradition of German uh, German, the Volkish, uh, the, the German Volk, the German people. So World War One did have a dramatic effect on the man. He came out of the war uh, resolute. He comes out of the war with a sense of purpose. And as I mentioned, the fact that he was a war hero gave him some credibility in right-wing circles. So he, he sort of gets that leg up. And we can tell that certainly beyond anything, at least in 1919, he was, in fact, an anti-Semite. Hitler adopts a party almost by accident. He returns to Bavaria and, like many people, um, ends up trying to stay in the army. And the army is being quickly disbanded as, as a result of the Treaty of Versailles. But at the same time, in Germany, there are socialist revolutions. And he ends up in a Bavarian unit of the Free Corps and sent to Munich to sort of help upend communist uprisings there. His job wasn't necessarily as a breaker of uprisings, but um, a spy on the right-wing fringe movements. He became enamored with parties like the German Workers' Party. Um, and eventually, he leaves the army and will join a fringe movement known as the National Socialist German Workers' Party. There, he'll soon make an impact on its early leader, a man named Anton Drexler, and will help Drexler, in fact, draw up his 25-point plan. He's one of the first people to join. His, uh, his membership card says he was a 550th, but in fact, it was uh, tradition within the Nazi party of that era to add a zero onto the card as, to, as if to see if there were actually more people. He was a 55th member of the Nazi party. Hitler will change the name of the, the DAP, that German Workers' Party, to the National Socialist uh, Democratic Workers' Party in February 1920 as an effort to sort of make it a little bit more broader. Not to say that Hitler had any particular socialist views, he just thought that that would stick or resonate with people, maybe get more people out to his speeches and so on. By 1921, Hitler's sort of impact on the party was such that he becomes effectively the shadow leader. And by 1922, um, the work of Hitler, predominantly through his speeches, makes it the largest right-wing party in Bavaria and in a position to mount, mount somewhat of a challenge to the German government. So what is it about Hitler's view that allows him to manipulate the National Socialist Democratic Workers' Party um, into something that is, I guess, can be called the largest right-wing party in the German province of Bavaria? Now, 
Hitler's views, I, I guess it's important to note at this particular point, are not original. Effectively, all he does is rehash social Darwinist, nationalist, racist opinions that exist in Germany for decades. He's able to give them, at best, at best, a fresh spin, perhaps some more significance through the power of his rhetoric. His idea as his ideas, his ideology, um, very clearly starts to develop in Munich in the early 1920s, and it's definitely influenced by right-wing intellectuals such as Alfred Rosenberg and Dietrich Eckhart, who were uh, prominent right-wing uh, intellectuals in Germany at that time, who were also uh, profoundly anti-Semitic. Um, all of his views really don't come in a fixed form in any way until you get to Mein Kampf in 1925. And that's Mein Kampf, of course, is a book that he writes after his failed 1923 Munich Putsch. He's put in, um, into prison. He's originally given uh, approximately, I think it's nine years, but he ends up only serving uh, less than 10 months and he's released for good behavior. The German judges, uh, something you'll look at on the other side of the course, are are incredibly sympathetic to right-wing uh, uprisings. They, they, they sort of, the judge and the judiciary, judiciary of the Weimar Republic, this dem democracy that's set up at the end of the uh, First World War, really are holdovers from the times of the Kaiserreich, and they still have that sort of right-wing authoritarian bent. And as such, people like Hitler, who committed high treason, killed policemen, during the 1923 music, music gets a slap on the wrist. In fact, his trial is more grandstanding than anything else. Now, in prison, he does use the time wisely. He, as you can see from uh, the picture on the right, he's not necessarily in hardcore prison. This isn't. Uh, this isn't. Uh, this isn't uh, maximum security. This is nothing like you've seen an American prison show or anything like that. It's quite a comfortable lodging. It's a, in fact, an old castle that he's imprisoned in. Anyway, he dictates Mein Kampf mostly to Rudolf Hess, and um, in in Mein Kampf, it's basically, well, it's uh, uh, first of all, it's unreadable. Um, secondly, it mostly consists of incoherent rambling. Um, however, there are a few interesting insights into propaganda. He does attempt in some form to try and explain his worldview. Uh, in that worldview, it is clear, though, that Hitler does see the elimination of Jewry from German life. Now, it's very unclear what elimination means. And that's where we start to get into the historical debate. What does elimination mean? Some historians have gone quite far to, uh, to the right and interpreted it as the elimination means the annihilation, i.e. extermination of the Jewish population of Germany and, and by extension Europe, but others seem to think that he just wants to remove them from public life, either by deportation or exclusion from the sort of the cultural social life of, of Germany. He also looks at, of course, things that will lead to World War II, the provision of Lebensraum or living space for the Germans in the East, and the destruction of communism, sort of foreshadowing his invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941. And as I said, his time in prison is relatively short. He serves nine months for good behavior. Um, interesting point on his release. Uh, there's a famous picture of him standing at the gate, supposedly to be the release of Hitler's, the, sort of the, the, the moment of Hitler's release from Landsberg Prison. It wasn't. It was, that photo was taken about four days later by a Nazi party photographer outside one of the uh, old gates of the city of Munich, which you can visit and stand on the exact spot that Hitler is pretending to break out of Landsberg Prison, but it's not actually Landsberg Prison. Nobody knew that back then anyway, so it sort of was widely accepted. It is. It is. Interesting tidbit from history. So what does Mein Kampf say? So here's what it says, um, at least as it regards to the racial struggle. He believes that race and the struggle between races is a central factor in world history. He believes that there's a, essentially a permanent struggle between the Aryan race, which comprises the Germans, and international Jewry. He believes that the Aryans are the fittest people on earth, and the Jews are relatively low down the uh, down the social totem pole, down essentially they're, as he calls them, blood-sucking parasites who aim to dominate the world themselves. Um, he believes that the Jews have undermined people's capacity for struggle, that Jews are inherently pacifist, they weaken people, they subvert racial purity, and they poison their institutions of Germany. In Mein Kampf, he also attaches a huge amount of responsibility to the Jews. Um, basically, every one of Germany's recent misfortunes are the Jews' fault. The loss of World War I, the Treaty of Versailles, the establishment of the democratic and, i.e., weak Weimar Republic. These things are all the fault of the Jews. They also have dangerous ideas. 
he believes that sort of international finance-led capitalism is a plot of the Jews. Internationalism instead of nativism, i.e. the I, sort of the, the concept of a, a broader European community would be a, a Jewish thing to undermine the German Volk. He also believes that liberalism, democracy, and Marxism, effectively everything that isn't right-wing authoritarian nationalism is a Jewish plot to undermine the Volkish Aryan race. He saw Jews as the sort of puppet masters of the Soviet Union. He, saw, he believed they were behind the 1917 uh, Russian Revolution. And the fact also proven by the fact that Jews were prominent in socialist and communist circles, not only in Germany, but internationally, gave a little bit of credence to this sort of um, incorrect claim that the Jews were sort of the puppet masters of the communist revolution. He points to people like Trotsky, who's a Jew. He points to Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, who were prominent socialist thinkers around the end of the First World War, and both of whom were murdered by the Free Corps in Berlin. Not the Free Corps that Hitler was part of, but the Free Corps in Berlin. Uh, and dumped in the river spray. If I ever take you guys to Berlin, I'll show you exactly where they were dumped off a bridge. But anyways, you can go visit that for yourself one day. There's a plaque there. A um, couple other things. He believes in the superiority of the Nordic race. Um, basically, he th believes that the Nordic Aryan race headed the racial league table. All other people, Slavs, Asiatics, Africans, these people are inferior. He also believes that Germans had a duty to increase their numbers, to fulfill their destiny toward world supremacy, and that they must remain racially pure. There's a pure blood um, effectively ensures racial success. And you see this in Nazi policy, as we'll study it later on. Um, his views on the nature of government, basically that there is no room for pity or sentimentality, that government should be hard and ruthless to do what's necessary to protect the people, to win the struggle between the races. Er, ergo, Germany must struggle to gain its rightful place as the strongest nation on earth. Germany must win more land, Lebensraum. This has to be done at the expense of Poland and the Soviet Union. And he also, they also should extend their power over the inferior Slavs in southeastern Germany. Germany also has to be ruled by the fittest person, and this person, whoever is the fittest Uberman, should have absolute power. Um, effectively, he wants to create a new social order where class conflict and division is disappears, and it's replaced by some sort of national solidarity, a loosely defined uh, idea known as the national community, or in German, the Volksgemeinschaft, the people's community. And this should come first and all sort of self-interest, i.e. the self-interest of money, the self-interest of religion, the self-interest of race or culture should be laid um, at the doorstep of the national community and subverted to that. Now, lastly, some conclusions on Hitler. Um, what we do know, Number one, from World War One, he developed a lifelong conviction in anti-Semitism that um, being central among them. We do know, number two, that his ideas are not original, but they're also underpinned by a simple and pretty horrific logic. We also know that he wasn't a... Uh, he was a, not a flexible opportunist. He was driven by a belief that um, he was preordained to lead Germany to greatness and maintained his views with a remarkable consistency. I have mentioned, and I will mention if I haven't, that Hitler's probably the most self-assured man in human history. He knows and almost remarkably where he's going and how he's going to get there. Um, well, he gets there in different ways, but he knows he's going to get there in the end. And this sort of fanatical conviction makes Hitler perhaps a lot more dangerous than just about anyone else in the German political scene at this particular time. Um, a couple other points on German post-war anti-Semitism. <clears throat> Number one, the Jews had played a prominent war in the uh, role, rather, in the post-war left-wing revolutions in Germany, the ones in 1918 and 1919 that you'll learn on the other side of the course. Um, this furthers the view that the Jews are responsible for Germany's defeat. Um, German nationalists fuel um, <clears throat> their support by blaming the Jews and associating them with communism, the communism that had almost overturned Germany during the German revolutions uh, that follow on from November 1918. Um, he points to the fact that there are a lot of Jews in what he calls the headquarters of Jewry, um, the sort of the Moscow-based communist international that was plotting to conquer the world. And it doesn't help that during the 1920s, people like Leon Trotsky are talking about not only the Russian revolution, but the world communist revolution. And Trotsky being a Jew fuels German nationalists and it fuels a lot of fears about people who begin to associate their, let's say, fear of communism with a fear of Jewry. Uh, in reality, of course, most Jews are moderate socialists at best. 
the other heap of them are, are Democrats. Um, there are many in prominent positions in the Weimar Republic, i.e. Walter Rathenau. Um, he was the foreign minister. And this does provide some nationalists that the government was in Jewish hands. In fact, most of these, the Jewish people who were involved in the Weimar Republic ended up getting assassinated by 1924, neither here nor there. Um, it does, at least early on, give, in the post-war era, give some credence to the fact that the government of the Weimar Republic is in the hands of the Jews. Um, a couple more points. The Germans will also identify the Jews with the degenerative modern influence of culture, music, film, art, and architecture. Uh, they will blame Jews for the decadence and the cultural experimentation of the late 1920s in the Weimar Republic. Uh, the fact that the Jews have uh, predominant places in the city's cultural life, particularly Berlin, Hamburg, and Frankfurt, um, sort of lends some sort of credence to, to the lie that they're a degenerative modern influence on culture. Jewish financiers are blamed for the Great Depression, which crippled Germany after World after uh, 1929. Um, though that's not necessarily true, um, they point to the fact that you know Jews at the head of American banks or Jews at the head of German banks were responsible for the Great Depression, when in fact it was many things uh, responsible for the Great Depression. Most right-wing parties after 1918, uh, those on the right of this political spectrum, and there are many, there could be as many as 30 parties going in a German election after 1918, but those on the right, most of them were anti-Semitic, as were most institutions of the Weimar Republic. Most certainly the high ranks of the army, the latent anti-Semitism of the pre-war years of the Kaiserreich sort of carries over to so the heads of the army are, many in the civil service, many in the judiciary, the judges and so forth, and certainly, um, there is also a latent anti-Semitism, particularly, particularly in the Protestant churches in Germany during the 1920s and 1930s. Also, it, you can sort of understand the lack of fight back, particularly from the Protestant churches in that respect, in, that, in, in, uh, in the 1930s to the sort of the provisions against Jews um, by sort of a latent anti-Semitism among the Protestant community. Now, many Germans are open about their anti-Semitism. Many Germans believe in the faked protocols of the elders of Zion, the sort of uh, leaked fake document that effectively a combination of European, largely Russian aristocrats who were Jewish, very rich men, were seeking to undermine Ger German society to steal from it and effectively set up the um, as the state of Israel by um, taking the money from, from, from Europe to do so. For many, though, of course, it is easier to hold these views than to, hate, to face the highly complex problems facing Germany. When you look at the situation in Germany, it's, imma it's immensely complex, um, particularly in the post-war era with reparations, the complexities around the Treaty of Versailles, the adoption of a new democratic government. And it's much easier for the people who, you know, perhaps are scared by it or don't understand it to find an easy scapegoat. And we see that being quite prevalent in the Jews. And that's why these people like Hitler and uh, other right-wing parties, I guess, will do so well in the post-war years. Last uh, point I'm going to make. The Nazi rise to power is not necessarily due to anti-Semitism, but Germans vote Nazis in large numbers for a combination of reasons um, that at least in some ways are linked to anti-Semitism. But let's put it this way. Number one, they vote for the Germans uh, and Hitler becomes the largest party in Germany for the following reasons. Number one, the Great Depression and unemployment. The fear of communism, which I suppose to a small extent can be linked to Jewish communism and, and, and that, but certainly there's a fear of communism amongst the, sort of the middle and upper classes, and a desire for a strong government after failed, consistently failing the Weimar governments. I believe in the 14 years of the Weimar government, there are 11 new governments, 11 elections in 14 years, and people start to think that democracy is a joke, and as such, they start to desire a strong government. Hitler's offering that, et cetera, et cetera, so they vote for it. In the 1930s, though, you know, if you really look at it, and anti-Semitism plays a, um, a small part in Hitler's rise to power, but a large, people, a large number of people, it's fair to say, accept an anti-Semitic message fully, or at least in part. Yet not, not all those who voted Nazi did so because they were vehemently anti-Semitic. We can't automatically say, and it would be wrong to assume, that people voted Nazi because they were anti-Semitic. Trust me, they had other options. But they did so for a host of reasons, of which being anti-Semitic was one. Um, very few people, 
1932, 1933 believe that Hitler will actually eliminate all of Germany's Jews. Most of the 44% of Germans who vote Nazi expected slash hoped, it would say, that he would take some actions for the Jews, which does give him sort of a legitimization of his early anti-Semitic protocols, which are, are gradual at best, but ever increasing, as we'll come to find out. So there's a quick overview of Hitler's sort of early anti-Semitism. Of course, the majority of this course deals with Hitler in power, but it's important to sort of get a, let's say, a foothold, a foundation in, in what that entails.